Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome back to New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Zach McCulley, and today I'm joined by the renowned writer and literary scholar, Philip Lopate. And we're going to talk about his new edited volume, The Golden Age of the American Essay, 1945. 1970. It's published in 2021 with Anchor Books, an imprint of Penguin Random House. And Philip, it's it's an honor to meet you, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Zach, for having me. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing about your book, and uh, you have some really interesting um, essays here that you that you've included. Some classics, some less familiar. Uh, but before we get into that, could you first tell tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you began uh, essay writing? Well. I was a fiction writer and a poet, um, and at a certain point, I fell in love with the essay. I realized that to some degree, uh, the essay could combine uh, the storytelling aspects of fiction with the associative uh, aspects of poetry. And I got hooked by the whole tradition of the essay, Montaigne, going down through um, Hazlitt, Lamb, uh, Virginia Woolf, James Baldwin, George Orwell. Um, I really got um, um, sucked into all that. And it became a form that I felt familiar writing in and also uh, teaching. So I did this whole anthology called The Art of the Personal Essay. Uh, And it's been a very popular book. It sold about a quarter of a million copies. And so I became known as a kind of champion of the essay. Uh, and then at a certain point, I, I thought about doing a big anthology of the American essay. Well, that morphed into three volumes. The first volume, the glorious American essay, uh, which told the whole story of the uh, American essay from colonial times to the present, was published a few months ago. And now the second volume, uh, the golden age of the American essay, uh, it's just coming out. Uh, so I am a dyed in the wool um, essayist, and um, I love the form. It's freedom um, and and um, it's flexibility. Yeah, very good. Well, I mean, you've had quite a profound career as an essayist. Um, you, you've won the, the Guggenheim Fellowship, National Endowment for the Arts grants. You're currently a professor writing at Columbia um, and teaching at Columbia. And in this book here, The Golden Age of the American Essay, you've given us quite a collection of essays, 38 of them that you've selected from this period between World War II and 1970. Let me ask you this, what, what made these 25 years such a fertile period for American essays? Oh, lots of things. Um, it just so happens that there were a lot of um, of literary journals uh, that were quite hospitable uh, to essay writing. Um, in fact, even newspapers and magazines um, welcomed essays at this point. Uh, I think that in some ways, um, it was a watershed moment in which America had to try to figure out uh, where it stood. Uh, it, was, it was suddenly the, the champion of the free world and um, the most powerful nation. And uh, so its intellectuals uh, felt called upon uh, to understand what was going on. Uh, So you had all these these publications, uh, you had this this singular moment, you had all these problems uh, that had to be addressed, uh, like uh, the Cold War, um, uh, there was a lot of, uh, racism, sexism, um, the degradation of the environment. Um, you had no end of problems that had to, had to be looked at. Um, so also, you know, there was this whole wave of European intellectuals who had settled in America and they had kind of raised the intellectual bar and, and American intellectuals uh, wanted, to, uh, wanted to write in a way that was, um, that was more intelligent, you might say. And the essay has always been a form um, for analysis, um, a form that privileged intelligence, you might say, over, over emotion. 
so this was a good time for for the essay. That's very good. Well, in the introduction of these essays, uh, you spend a little bit of time talking about the idea of liberalism, and you make this connection to the practice or or um, ideology of essay writing. Talk to us about how you're using the term liberal. What's the idea of of liberal consensus? And then what, what's the relationship that, that you're seeing between essayism and, and liberalism? Well, Lionel Trilling said at, at a certain point that uh, in this time, in this post-war period, that, uh, that there was a liberal consensus, in part because um, uh, radical Marxism had, had proven um, to some degree to lead to Stalinism. And so, um, so you know, intellectuals, moved away from, uh, from Marxism uh, and liberalism is something that in a way advocates the middle way. Uh, the New Deal had, had, you know, of FDR um, had been welcomed by, by writers and intellectuals um, and to some degree it had saved capitalism. So liberalism um, supported Reformism. It was. It was. You know, liberal, liberalism is something that has always been drawn to uh, skepticism, to uh, anti-dogmatism, anti-fanaticism, and to some degree anti-revolution. So this was a this was a good um, ideology for a moment when um, intellectuals had lost their appetite for revolution, um, and they were. They were advocating uh, progressive changes. And this has always been part of the ideology of essays as well. Uh, Montaigne, for instance, uh, uh, was someone who, who advocated the middle way and equanimity. Um, and Emerson, the same thing. So basically, uh, essayism, I'm calling it essayism, but really what I mean is the practice of essays uh, was, was something that uh, felt very comfortable with, uh, with self-skepticism, with thinking against oneself, um, and, and with a kind of um, a temperate attitude towards things. And so it, it folded very neatly into liberalism. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, you know, one of the essays you include here, then I guess this is where we should, where sh we should go next is uh, this essay by Irving Howe, the, the the age of conformity, and this is one that shows a bit of wariness of uh, toward toward liberal consensus. And you say Irving Howe, he wasn't necessarily alone either in this, because a lot of essayists um, sort of saw themselves as guardians, gatekeepers of of particular standards. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this essay? How do, how does Howe uh, talk? talk about um, or, or show this kind of wariness uh, in the essay you include here? Well, Irving Howe was a, was a brilliant uh, social and literary critic. And, and in this essay, um, he, he proves himself to be very skeptical of the liberal consensus, which he felt basically was, was, was a mush of, um, you know, of, um, uh, didn't have any clarity of ideas, and, and was complacent. He was worried that intellectuals and, and, and writers were being co-opted by the academy, co-opted by the bureaucracy, um, and, and basically they were being, they were being bought off. Um, and so he, was, he, he thought that, that, uh, that liberalism was going to um, lead to a kind of, um, um, I don't know what to say, a kind of uh, shallowness and a lack of articulation, a lack of edge. Um, and so he was worried about conformity. Uh, and, 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 and I think that in a way, he was, a, he was ahead of the game because nowadays liberalism is attacked from both the left and the right. Uh, liberalism has become something of a dirty word. Uh, you know, at a certain point, nobody wants, wanted to admit that they were liberal. Um, but I do think that 
to some degree, um, the liberal tradition uh, has persisted, even though uh, the word itself uh, has lost some of its, its um, credibility. So certainly, um, you know, for a radical like Irving Howe, um, liberalism was a kind of threat uh, because it, 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 um, it moved away from radical solutions. But something to notice is that this very essay is written in a, in a liberal mode. That is, it's written uh, in, a, in a very uh, thoughtful, uh, self-skeptical, uh, and, and um, uh, unreasonable way, which is entirely in the tradition of the literary uh, literature. Okay, good. Well, you know, Philip, one, one th other thing that stands out uh, here that you say is, is there was a fair amount of, of criticism uh, and written debate between writers. And yet you say, as, as many lambasted one another uh, and, and had differing opinions in the post-war era, there was, there was this observable intellectual tone in the writing. Um, I'm wondering, can you talk to us about this aspect of essayists writing to show intelligence and, and show their learning? Well, some of it came about um, from a group called the New York Intellectuals, um, many of whom were Jewish and, and, and were, were seeking to elbow their way into American culture. And it turned out that, um, that this kind of nonfiction, literary criticism, um, was, a, was a, a home for them, a way that they could establish uh, their, own, their, own, um, their own bona fides, you could say. So they, they, they competed with each other. Um, they went up with, they went up to each other. Um, and, and there was a kind of a, a competition of ideas they took ideas seriously. And so in taking ideas seriously, they also um, uh, criticized each other. Uh, and that was, that was allowable, you might say. Uh, so I think that it was a, it was a period when, when there was a lot of intellectual showing off, you might say. Um, they had been influenced a great deal by T.S. Eliot and by, by the, the English way of, of doing essays. Uh, and, and there was a certain formal tone uh, to their writing, um, but they were also using their brains like stilettos, cutting each other, you might say. Uh, so this was all part of this kind of um, um, intellectual tone uh, that they were adopting. Um, and um, oh, some of that is, has certainly um, disappeared in American letters, uh, but it was very present at that time. Well, you know, Philip, uh, that's really helpful. And, and I guess as we move forward a little bit, we've talked about how this, this period was such a, a rich time for the flourishing of essays. But as we think about these particular essays that you've selected here, how did you land on these specifically? And, and what was the process like of choosing what to include in this book? Well, to be honest, a lot of them would have gone into the first volume. Um, but the publisher uh, gave me a page limit in that first volume of only 900 pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, in order to put in a lot of these essays, it would have had, I would have had to uh, done a, a 2,000 page uh, book, which of course was impossible. But one of, the, one of the principles I established in that first volume, which I continued in this volume, was I wanted to show how essays could percolate in almost every um, discipline in almost every form. So for instance, um, you could have um, essays on, on theology, uh, and I've included one by Reinhold Niebuhr here. Um, you could have essays um, on um, art criticism, and I've included a Clement Greenberg one uh, on modern painting. You could have essays on sports, John Updike's piece about Ted Williams. Um, you could have essays on the environment, Rachel Carson uh, writing about uh, uh, basically uh, pesticides. Um, you could have uh, a piece by Martin Luther King, his letter from Birmingham jail. I wanted to show how, how letters, 
speeches, um, criticism, uh, could, all, uh, could all be different ways of doing essays. Uh, there's, for instance, a wonderful essay, uh, one of my favorites by Edwin Denby, the dance critic, called Dances, Buildings, and People in the Streets, in which he's talking about uh, ways of observing uh, movement. Um, and, and, and it connected very well to this, this period of the 50s when there were a lot of uh, breakthroughs uh, in, in art. You had, the, you had the abstract expressionists, you had um, uh, the, the, the dance of Merce Cunningham or, or Balanchine, uh, you had jazz, um, and I have Albert Murray writing about uh, the blues and jazz. Um, so I wanted to show something about how uh, the essay could accommodate um, any and every uh, genre and any uh, uh, discipline. And, yeah, and I think you did that really well. It's it's a fascinating collection. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of these are recognizable. Some of them are anyway. Um, and and many are, are well received uh, today. But how were these essays received at the time they were written? Did did people in this period between 1945 and 1970, did they spend time um, talking about these essays? I think so. I think that essays were... were um were a source of conversation at dinner parties, you know, mm. uh, at gatherings. So for instance, you had an essay by Leslie Fiedler called Come Back to the Raff Again, Huck Honey, in which he talks about, you might say, the, 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 homo, the homoerotic um, tradition in American literature. Um, and it was talked about quite a lot. Um, and then there was this essay by George F. Kennan called The Sources of Soviet Conduct, in which he talks, he talks about um, what the what what the Soviets really were intending, uh, and basically warning uh, America uh, that um, that Stalin and the Soviets did not really wish us uh, that much good, and that was talked about a great deal. Um, so you know, you had these essays that that they were very provocative. Uh, one of them, for instance, uh, Richard Hofstadter is the paranoid style in American politics is still being talked about. In fact, it, it's, it's come around, you know, because there's still a lot of paranoia in American politics um, to be something that's, that's perennially cited um, as a kind of a keystone way of looking at this problem. Uh, so yes, not all of them were talked about, but, but certainly uh, they were part of the, the cultural conversation at the time. Well, Philip, I suspect many of our listeners will be interested in, in picking up a copy of this volume after they hear this, but could you give us, uh, for, for some of us who may be on the fence, uh, could you give us uh, a, a few of the essays which you find most meaningful? What are, what are some of your favorites here included? Well, I do have, I do like all of them, so you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, but for instance, um, there's an essay by Lionel Twilling called The Last Lover, in which he analyzes um, Nabokov's uh, Lolita. And he, 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 the way he kind of like teases out all the, 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 um, the, the ambivalence uh, and all the, co the contradiction in that novel is really interesting. Um, and then you've got an essay by Elizabeth Hardwick, who was a wonderful essayist on Boston, which is a somewhat uh, bitchy analysis of Boston. Um, but it is, it is incredibly clever um, and, 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 and well worth reading. Um, and uh, is, I mentioned the Edwin Denby essay, Dances, Buildings, and People in the Street, which I love. Um, but then you've got something like Tom Wolfe's uh, The Girl of the Year, in which he just has a tremendous amount of fun writing about this, this woman who is famous for being famous. Um, and of course, uh, Joan Didion's essay on the morning after the 60s, uh, which, uh, which closes the book. Uh, well, Didion has become, you know, a kind of um, saint of essay writing in a way. Uh, and this one is, is done with a typical uh, intelligence and, and feeling for, uh, for the spirit of the age. Mm. 
Yeah, very good. Well, uh, I, I think probably a fitting way to, to wrap up our conversation is uh, to note how this collection is, is capped off by the year 1970. Um, but can you tell us what happens after this date though? Is, is, what is the state of essay writing past 1970 and, and the 21st century perhaps? Um, and, and then also you alluded to this earlier, I think, um, would you consider compiling an anthology uh, for this later period? I have in fact compiled a, an anthology okay. <laughs> contemporary American essay, which is uh, devoted to the 21st century, which happens to be this moment, a very good time uh, for American essays. You know, 25 years ago, um, essays were, were not considered um, commercial, and publishers were afraid even to put the word essay on the cover of a book. But now there are so many younger essays who are young essayists who appeal to younger readers. I think that um, to some degree, uh, the essay has become a way of dealing with, um, with identity, uh, with ethnicity, um, with, with, with sex and gender, um, so that uh, every, every group has found um, its, its, its voice and its identity um, by picking up the essay and trying to understand uh, uh, that the nature of, of that um, membership, you might say. Uh, so we're, we're going through a very good period commercially uh, for the essay. Uh, and and um, and so people should maybe uh, look out for that first for third volume, which is uh, the contemporary American essay. Yeah, well, we'll we'll keep an eye out for that, and and perhaps uh, we can have you back on the show to talk about it. Well, thanks so much, yeah. Zach, for having yeah. me this time. Yeah, great, and and thanks so much for for writing this book um, for everyone listening. It is the golden age of the American essay. It's out with Anchor Books, and uh, it was published just just this month in, in 2021. And Philip, thanks so much for taking the time with us this evening. My pleasure. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you again next time on New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network.